to go back to the beginnings of agriculture. And, and in a way, you could say any agriculture, any selection of the seed, for example, from a wheat crop or a rice crop by a farmer to plant the next year was always selection and in a way genetic manipulation because you took some individuals and not others. So we as humans have always been influencing the crops genetically. And plant breeding in a classical sense was a way of combining two parents with different characteristics and get a new uh, generation that was better. That's what we always have done. And to understand genetic um, mechanisms, or sorry, genetic methods, modern methods, actually is the best way to look at it is as a very complex set of tools, a toolbox that allows you um, to select far more precisely, as Pam has described, the genes that you want. In the past, as Monty was still doing, by backcrossing these two different types of, of rice, you had to uh, get in a lot of other genes that you didn't control. So in a way, this is a far more precise set of tools. The problem, I think, is not with the toolbox. The problem is with the end result. Many people are comfortable with using the tools, but they're not comfortable if the end result is a genetically modified organism, i.e. A, a plant or an animal that has genes that have somehow been manipulated, and the word itself is already charged, to become something else which it wouldn't have become through so-called natural means. And the whole thing hinges on what is natural. <laughs> Um, I think the feeling I have, and, and I think my colleagues as well, is that this is a step in a process that hasn't been natural from the start, if you want, because we always wanted to have, as humans, desired characteristics. Now, many people draw the line in the sense that they feel, okay, if I'm having a genetically modified rice, like the, like the golden rice, which has so many good characteristics, and it still comes close to what, it, what rice was before, that's okay. But if we start to build in, say, um, a gene from a fish, as has been done in, in, in California, to um, help cold tolerance or frost, frost tolerance in strawberries, that's going too far. And that is indeed a fine line. I would say the, the, the way to look at that is threefold. It's the purpose for which you do the genetic manipulation. It is uh, whether, the, that, uh, whether it comes from a gene that is somehow close to the kind of crop or plant or animal you're talking about, or whether it's a very wide cross or a very, from a very different thing, more people have a problem with that. And also, whether the end justifies the means. And I think there, there are two problems that people feel very strongly is, what is the environmental risk and what is the human health risk? Well, give us an idea about what environmental risk or health risk well, would be, the, because we hear that genetic manipulated foods, genetic engineers, might be let bad me for Let me start with the, well, let, with the human health risk. Um, and you have, one has to formulate this very precisely. The fact that so many hundreds of millions of Americans have been eating genetic, genetically modified soybean and maize and a couple of other things, and we've not found any risks greater than what would occur naturally with the consumption of non-genetically modified foods suggests that there is not a health risk that we can trace now. However, the absence of evidence of an additional risk is not the proof of the contrary. It doesn't mean that therefore we can assume it's safe, but we can only assume it's within the kinds of risks that we see today. Nobody has gotten sick, as far as we know, in this country and other countries from eating a genetically modified organism. However, when we talk about environmental risk, the story is a little bit more complicated because we're not dealing with one other organism being man, man or woman it is with a whole ecosystem. And so particularly what happens um, in the soil, for example, or whether genes escape, as some people think. Um, we, what we know is that there is really no uh, easy outcrossing of genetically modified organisms, for example, with wild weeds. There are no super weeds occurring right now. Um, but that risk is not to be excluded completely. And certainly when you think of lower types of bacteria, for example, or organisms in the soil, there may be an effect that we don't know yet. And I feel very strongly that we should monitor the environmental side very carefully, also internationally. But so far, actually, the, the record is quite good. There's another issue here that I want to add to all of this that is the general impression out there that genetically modified, genetically engineered, or manipulated foods are part of a whole system that also brings in large factory farming, monocultures, 
that there's um, a link between genetically modified foods and monocultures, which are susceptible to disease and also limit the biodiversity of our food sources. Just to make clear, in the United States, the situation is very different than is predicted in other parts of the world. So in the US, um, the major genetically engineered crops are produced by major corporations, corn, soy, cotton. And in, in other parts of the world, they're expected to be um, crops like rice, cassava, maize, that um, farmers would take care of themselves on their fields. So anyway, just looking in the United States, they found um, tremendous reductions in insecticides. So when people are looking at environmental risks, for example, we really need to think about the amount of insecticides that are used globally. It's predicted that about 300,000 people die every year from overuse of insecticides. 300,000? Yes, and in California alone, um, in the developed world, we're seeing 1,200 pesticide poisonings every year. And genetically engineered crops, as they're used in the United States, have dramatically reduced the amounts of insecticides.